Out of ground, uh, and I don't want to. I usually do a bit of off the cuff. Um, so tonight I'm going to do something a little unusual for me. Um, I'm going to give the talk in iambic pentameter. Um, no, I, I'm actually going to read uh, some sections, uh, large sections of the uh, of the talk. But I, I will do a dramatic reading, and we all know queers love drama. So I begin. Uh, you heard the news today, by the way. The German penguins, wow. the male, the male gay penguins, wow. who found an abandoned egg. They uh, incubated it, uh, and now for the first time in captivity, we have gay male yeah. penguin daddy. Uh, it's all natural. Uh, I, 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 that had nothing to do with the talk, really. Well, something. Uh, anyway, uh, I, I'm a huge fan of Hollywood movies from the 40s and the 1950s. And um, it's, it's quite telling that the portrayal of idealized bodies, behavior, and erotic desires of that era bear a striking contrast to our own. The iconic female figure of Marilyn Monroe, the 50s starlet who was posted on locker rooms and walls and uh, dorm rooms and what have you, uh, workplaces, was, was perceived as a sort of quintessence of femininity uh, of that era. She was blonde, white, voluptuous, sexually alluring, and unthreatening to men. Today, see, I'm very bad with things. Te all things technical, I'm a total screw up. Um, <laughs> Today, I think she would be considered uh, chunky. She was about a size 12. Uh, weak, you know, she wasn't, didn't have that, that chiseled Madonna uh, body, uh, and a bit stupid by modern standards uh, in, in terms of her uh, composure and posture towards men, but a, a lot of that was actually quite a ruse. I mean, she was married to Arthur Miller, playwright, The Crucible. The woman had a brain, it was all game. Um, and, and the male screen idols of the 1950s, people like Rock Hudson, uh, people like uh, Humphrey Bogart, um, you know, there are many, William Holden, old, self-assured, chiseled, rugged faces, but none of them were sort of muscular or fit by today's standards. Uh, their attitudes towards female leads would be seen as grossly sexist and controlling uh, 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 today. Since World War II ended 65 years ago, our notions of sex, gender, and sexuality have undergone enormous transformations. The rise of the United States to the position of a global uh, economic and military behemoth, an empire stronger than any other in history, was accompanied by ideological shifts and scientific changes that have altered our physiques, our self-perceptions, and our erotic choices and desires. As the United States fought to gain and hold on to global hegemony through cold and hot wars abroad, it launched a repressive ideological assault on the home front, including sex wars to establish behavior norms, I would argue, for the smooth functioning of empire. As a result, in many ways, we are physically and sexually transformed from our grandparents' generation. And yet the predominance of certain sex and gender norms that emerged in that era continue to define and repress us all. I want to discuss what we can learn from the post-war sex wars, and by that I mean the social and legal policing of our intimate lives that are periodically punctuated by what are often referred to as moral panics. Also, I'll lay out what socialists argue is needed to shake off these asphyxiating norms, to end these sex wars once and for all, and to create a society in which our sex, gender, and sexuality are truly liberated. Now let's first define some terms, because I think for a lot of people, terms get thrown around with the presumption of uh, familiar familiarity or agreement. Uh, what the hell is the difference between sex and gender anyway? So let's just get that covered. Sex refers to biological differences, chromosomes, hormonal profiles, internal and external sex organs, whereas gender describes the characteristics that a society or culture delineates as masculine uh, or feminine. As a, a, a dear friend of mine likes to say, uh, sex is below the belt, gender is above the shoulders. Um, so that's the uh, shorthand. Whereas sexuality, of course, refers to our erotic sex preferences, whether you desire a woman, a man, both, um, you know, many, furry animals, uh, whatever, your left hand, gizmos, whatever. That's your sexuality, just so we're clear on that. And sex wars, which are often referred to as uh, sex panics, are these moral crusades that lead to crackdowns um, on, uh, on those perceived as sort of um, sexual outsiders. Before we move on to discuss the post-war sex wars, I want to just sort of lay out in, in, in quite brief, uh, briefly, um, a sort of 
you know, Marxist case for the social construction of our gender behavior, our sexuality, and even to some degree, uh, our physical sex. Because once you grasp the dynamic impact of social forces on our intimate lives, it's easier to comprehend the fact that challenging sex, gender, and sexuality norms cannot be separated from the wider struggles for social and economic justice. So very, very briefly, and of course I take it on in much greater depth in sexuality and socialism, uh, but the historical evidence confirms that what we define today as homosexual behavior um, uh, has existed for at least thousands of years, and it's logical to assume that human beings have been uh, partaking in these kinds of acts uh, pretty much since the beginning uh, uh, of, 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 of us walking the earth. Uh, but it, it took really the re industrial revolution of the late 19th century to create the potential for vast numbers of ordinary people to live outside the nuclear family, allowing for modern gay, lesbian, and bisexual uh, uh, identities to be born. And not really until the late 20th century did some gender variant people begin to identify themselves as transgender, though people who have defied modern Western concepts of gender appropriate behavior have existed throughout history and, uh, and throughout about many, many different cultures. The systemic oppression of LGBT people as it is experienced in most contemporary Western societies, therefore, is also a fairly recent phenomenon in, in, in human history. That's not to argue, however, that prior to capitalism, humans existed in some sort of sexual paradise, free of repression or restrictions of any kind. Rather, legal prohibitions and social taboos from antiquity through the pre-capitalist era existed in many cultures on the basis of sex acts often denouncing non-procreative sex without the condemnation or even the conception of sexual identity as an intrinsic or salient feature of a person's being. Contemporary industrial societies created the possibility for men and women to identify themselves and live as gays and lesbians. Um, while previous class societies prohibited certain sex acts, the rising capitalist state and its defenders in the field of medicine, law, and uh, the academy stepped in to define and control human sexuality in ways previously unimagined. These 19th century professionals reflected the interests and prejudices of the rising middle class. With economic growth and development came the need for higher levels of education for more kinds of jobs, which extended adolescence and removed teenagers from any occupations, thus reducing the social interaction between unrelated adults <coughs> and uh, teenagers. Medical professionals aiming to legitimize their fields pathologized masturbation, encouraged age of consent laws, and pressed for higher minimum ages for marriage. Homosexual relations between adults and so-called innocent minors I haven't seen any here at this conference, by the way, <laughs> were outlawed and juveniles were rendered asexual. No less a figure than Sigmund Freud, the father of modern psychiatry at the turn of the 20th century, theorized and popularized the problem of homosexuality while transforming heterosexuality into, in his words, the norm we all know without ever thinking much about. Most obviously, our conceptions about gender roles have changed radically from one society to another and from one historical period to the next. You need watch only one episode of Mad Men, which I love, um, I love that show, to be jolted into this sort of sexist time warp. Uh, it, it's set in the early 1960s, for those of you um, who haven't seen it, and, and it's sort of soaked in this kind of unapologetic, boorish male behavior. And, and Marilyn Monroe-like uh, feminine ideals of passivity and sexual allure. This is even into the early 1960s. The show is set in like 60, 61, and 62. Even our bodies have been radically transformed by our changing material conditions. Modern female athletes like the Williams sisters, Venus and Serena, not only have powerful athletic chiseled bodies, but their appearance, appearances are considered beautiful, which would have been inconceivable one generation ago, especially for black women. Advances in nutrition, training, and civil rights, in addition to their individual talents, created the potential for two dark-skinned black women to become the global tennis giants that they are. In addition, medical science has long acknowledged the existence of millions of people whose bodies combine anatomical features that are conventionally associated with either men or women. These intersex individuals, estimated at one birth in every 2,000 in the United States alone, are legally operated on by pediatricians who force traditional norms of genitalia appearance on newborn infants, often rendering them incapable of experiencing sexual pleasure later in life. 
The physical reality of intersex people calls into question the fixed notions that we are taught to accept about men and women. Intersex people challenge not only society's construction of gender roles, but compel us to examine the concept that sex itself is constructed, confined, and forced to fit into a tidy male-female binary. It appears that even our physical sex, and not just how we comport ourselves, is far more ambiguous and fluid than previously imagined. Socialists argue that what human beings have constructed, we can also tear down. It's not that social constructionists like me believe that humans are merely some blank slates upon which society makes its mark, but instead we believe that there is a complex interplay between nature and environment, and that much of what we are taught to believe is simply natural and biologically determined is not. A socialist society must be one in which people are liberated to engage in whatever sexual gratification they desire, so long as no other person is harmed. From the vantage point of socialists like me, ending the material conditions of class and imperial competition would necessarily involve an overthrow of the sexual and gender order that exists to prop up capitalism. I want to, well, we ain't there yet. I want to get into the, um, the sort of lavender scare, as it's popularly known. There's a very good book uh, available at Haymarket that's uh, he'll promote up, up here after my talk. Prior to the Depression, Sexual relations between men and women were undergoing huge shifts. In the 1920s, men and women were no longer marrying relative strangers, instead companionate marriage, in other words, you actually fell in love with the person, um, in which romance and sexual pleasure were expected came to be the norm, especially for the new middle class. American capitalism no longer required an ethic of endless work and ascetism in order to accumulate the capital to build an industrial infrastructure. Instead, corporate America needed consumers and advertising came into its own as, uh, as an industry in the 1920s, with madmen consciously striving to incite purchasing desire. Along with that came a new concept of womanhood, which emphasized a woman's sexual allure for the very first time. And women's appearance and demeanor was shaped by her new role as sex object and doting wife. All that largely collapsed in the 1930s. The enormous economic and social upheavals of the Depression built mass left-wing parties of socialists and communists that were key to building enormous trade unions and challenging racial segregation. The war itself tore apart racial, uh, sexual, and gender norms by throwing the whole of society behind a war effort that raised blacks' expectations for equality, shifted women's roles from uh, home into the workplace, and created a sexual bonanza for budding gays and lesbians, as well as those who had never before conceived of such se sexual possibilities, but experimented in the single-sex barracks and factory dorms of World War II. Nothing shook up the sexual consciousness of post-war American society, like the release in, of, 19, of the 1948 and 1953 Kinsey reports on American male and female sexual behavior. 50% of 10,000 men surveyed admitted erotic feelings at some point toward other men. 37% had had sex with men. 4% claimed to be gay. Of the women surveyed, 28% admitted uh, erotic feelings toward other women while 13% said they'd had sex with women, and about 2% uh, claimed to be lesbians. Alfred Kinsey said that given the predominance of homophobia, his results indicated, quote, such activity would appear in the histories of a much larger proportion of the population if there were no social constraints. He was actually quite a radical. In fact, he was considered a communist and, uh, uh, and therefore bad in the 1950s. Uh, <laughs> Kinsey wasn't really, but... Uh, uh, but he talked about sex, and that made you a communist, but really everything did. Um, or Jewish. Uh, Kinsey's, uh, nothing was worse than a communist Jewish gay person. Uh, <laughs> the 1950s outlaw. Uh, uh, where are they? Kinsey's study gave public expression to the reality of a growing gay minority in the United States. This was to have profound impact on gays' ability to mobilize for their rights. Gays in the U.S. went from complete isolation to developing an awareness of themselves as an oppressed class of people in the immediate post-war period. If the war opened up a vast space for the development of a gay community, and I use actually the terms that are used to, that are historically correct for that period. I'm not trying to get up anybody's nose who prefers queer or LGBT. Um, 
The post-war period witnessed uh, concerted attempts to close that space. The shifting uh, needs of the American empire, which emerged from the war as a superpower, did in fact create both the conditions for heightened repression and sowed the seeds of opposition. There were strong economic and social incentives for ratcheting up harassment and legal discrimination against gays after the war, with US industry churning out more than 60% of all manufactured goods in the world. That's what happens when you bomb the crap out of the rest of the world. You're number one. Um, uh, with US industry churning out more than 60% of manufactured goods in the world, the need for a higher birth rate to staff the labor force and military raised the idealization of the nuclear family to new levels. America's new industrial prowess brought household appliances and marketing blitz unknown to previous generations of working class people. <laughs> Women were driven out of the industrial jobs they held during the war, right? Men were back from the war, they got the jobs. Women uh, were sh shifted out of those jobs. White women were told to go back home, put on a house dress, and make babies, while black women were meant to return to their pre-war jobs as low-wage domestic servants. Gone were women's practical, square-shouldered, androgynous fashions of the 1940s. In came the frilly dresses with exaggerated busts and hyper-feminine lines of the 1950s my kind of style. Uh, unlike the previous image of the working class male who in the 30s unionized, took political action, and went on strike, a new masculine domesticity was encouraged in the 1950s. Sociologists like C. Wright Mills dissected corporate America's drive to create organization man, an obedient team player who assiduously followed the rules of the corporate structure, bowed to authority, and sought domestic scrutiny. Um, uh, domestic security while eschewing confrontation and struggle. The new medium of television was used to help promote a suburban family man, an avid consumer, in shows like Father Knows Best and Ozzie and Harriet and Leave It to Beaver. Um, as one historian put it, Cold War political discourse tended to position Americans who protested the rise of organization man or who rejected the post-war American dream of owning a home in the suburbs as homosexuals and lesbians who threatened the nation's security. A new warrior was created, strong, silent, emotionally unexpressive, sometimes angry, an alienated heterosocial man. He had to marry, have children, objectify women, and hate gays. One fascinating insight that uh, actually an author by the name of Gilbert Hurt, he wrote Moral Panics, Sex Panics. I, I, think it was, I thought it was a very interesting insight he had, um, was that, the, uh, and I'll, I'll quote him here, the extraordinary fact of the then two superpowers um, is how uncannily their gender roles mirrored aspects of the reproductive purity and anti-gay bias of the Nazis. Soviet masculinity under Stalin and American masculinity under General and then President Eisenhower were alike in more ways than they differed. Nazis, Stalinists, 50s, interesting. <laughs> this heightened, people know what the Eisenhower jacket is too? That short, you know, square show, everybody looks good in the Eisenhower jacket. Even Eisenhower and he looked like crap. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, it was sort of like encapsulated, you know, strong man, you know, out there, you know, taking charge. Um, this sort of heightened emphasis on the nuclear family was part and parcel of an era of political reaction in the United States. The launching of the Cold War with the Soviet Union brought with an anti-communist witch hunt at home known as McCarthyism. Even before the electoral rise of Republican Senator Joseph McCarthy, whose name came to symbolize an era of, uh, an era of conformity and hostility to dissent, Democratic President Truman, who was FDR's heir, after FDR died in 44, signed the Miller Sexual Psychopath Law in 1948. The act substantially increased the penalties for sexual crimes in the District of Columbia, and it was the first time sodomy in the United States was defined to mean any penetration, no matter how slight. <laughs> of, <laughs> I'm just quoting the law. <laughs> No matter how slight of the mouth or anus of one person with the sexual organs of another. You got it? <laughs> a pervert elimination campaign, that's what it was called, Operation Pervert Elimination, uh, was... <laughs> you can't make this shit up. 
um, uh, started as an unprecedented federal program to harass and arrest gay men known, uh, uh, known, uh, in known cruising areas. The Depression-era New Deal programs that were followed by the, uh, by the war had massively increased the federal government's employment roles in, in Washington, and wa as well as Washington, D.C.'s population. The civil service became the first large, sexually integrated, white-collar bureaucracy in the country. D.C.'s need for clerical workers led to a federal workforce in that city that was 60% female, and they were mandated by law to receive equal pay for equal work. What a good idea. Um, almost unheard of anywhere um, in, in the nation. The federal civil service became a magnet for young women seeking opportunities outside of traditional marriage. Thanks. Um, and as a result, became a huge attraction for lesbians and anyone else seeking an unconventional lifestyle, including, of course, gay men. As part of a Republican attack on the expansion of the welfare state over the previous 20 years, right, which would have been the 30s and 40s, young women and men who worked in the State Department and lived single lives became the targets of a lavender scare, which spread first throughout the federal and then the state government agencies. In the midst of a developing Cold War with the Soviet Union, the Republicans saw an opportunity to get back into power by questioning the manliness and loyalty of the New Deal brain trusters who were derided as college-educated crackpots, communists, and queer intellectuals. You have to sort of picture like a, a staff of like Sarah Palin's with fedoras. That's what has <laughs> been setting the tone. The aim, what well, was kind of true, uh, you know, old people with brains, uh, uh, although the hopey choosy, the hopey changey line, very good. Um, how's that hopey changey thing going for you? She didn't write it, but she delivered it well. Um, the aim was to drastically cut the rising cost of government services and end the expansion of the welfare state. In the eyes of conservatives, the New Deal programs needed to be gutted, and they articulated it in moral and gender terms. Unmarried women who dominated the secretarial pools and low-level bureaucracies were attacked as a femocracy. Having usurped the role of men in the workplace, the argument went, they were doing so in the bedroom as well. Though not a single example was ever discovered of a homosexual American citizen who revealed state secrets, gays and lesbians were targeted as a security threat, just like communists. A dragnet against tens of thousands took place over years with the avid participation of Democrats as well as Republicans. All of this was ramped up when General Eisenhower won the presidency in the election of 1950. Thousands were interrogated for their sexual conduct. Failure to answer charges was considered an admission of guilt. And interrogators insisted, and this is really bizarre, on the names and sexual details of all of their homosexual acts. And you just try, and, and actually in the public, in the congressional record somewhere, is a bunch of like, Beefy guys in fedora saying, were his balls hairy? I mean, you, that's literally, it's in the record. I'm not making this, I make some of it up, but not that. <laughs> gotta read more of the congressional record. That's, it's gotta be a hoot. In 1953, President Eisenhower signed an executive order barring gays and lesbians from working in the federal government. It's estimated that about 5,000 people lost their jobs after being accused of homosexuality. By 1958, 20% of all employed Americans had to go through some kind of security screening that included scrutiny of their sex lives not for any kind of job. In some parts of the country, hostility to gay men approached hysteria. In 1955, for example, there was an extensive investigation of gay men in Boise, Idaho a known cruising zone. <laughs> 1,400 people were interrogated and coerced into identifying the names of other gay residents. Countless state employees, teachers, hospital workers, and others lost their jobs as a result of official policy. Beginning in 1958, the Florida Legislative Investigative Committee, which had been established by the legislature in 56 to investigate and discredit civil rights activists, you know, you know what they're up to, uh, all sorts of queer stuff. Um, they, they turned their attention to homosexuals working in the state's universities and public schools. Its initial investigation of the University of Florida, go Gators, um, there's a bunch of them here, resulted in the dismissal of 14 faculty and staff members and in the next five years it interrogated hundreds of suspected gay men and women. I want to move out of the 50s as quickly as humanly possible <laughs> and, uh, and talk about some of the resistance because sex wars have been met with resistance. 
The first ever ongoing gay political group, of course, formed in LA in 1950, and a couple of years later, that was the Manichean Society, uh, launched by Harry Hay and other uh, members of the Communist Party who left the Communist Party and formed, uh, and formed the Manichean Society. A couple of years later, lesbian group, um, the Daughters of Valetus formed as well, but really, and both of them really focused on that 1953 executive order banning, uh, banning gays and lesbians from uh, the federal workforce. But by the 60s, a sexual and gender rebellion was in the making. The most significant scientific advance that impacted millions of American women, in particular, was the FDA's approval of the birth control pill in 1960. Nothing says you've got control over your body when you've got control over your body. For the first time, women could have control over their reproductive functions, reducing fears of unwanted pregnancies 13 years before the Supreme Court decision, Roe v. Wade, that allowed for legal uh, abortions. Helen Gurley Brown's Sex and the Single Girl became a bestseller in the early 1960s, echoing the new playboy mystique of Hugh Hefner. Gurley Brown argued that marriage was, in her words, insurance for the worst years of your life. During your best years, you don't need a husband. <laughs> was revolutionary in 1962 or something. It was an era that saw the rise of the personal ads in magazines and newspapers. And for the first time, straight, youthful, unmarried sexual enjoyment was celebrated, not condemned. Even American housewives were beginning to question the expectation of middle-class married life called the problem that has no name in Betty Friedan's The Feminine Mystique. A shift in values that glamorized the straight urban singles culture was at least a, in part a feature of shifting economic life. The expansion of the retail and service sectors in the labor, of the labor force, known then as the pink collar economy, drew both married and single women into the job market. Economic prosperity rested on an ethic of ever greater, greater consumption than was even conceivable in the 1950s. As one advertising executive explained, one of the basic problems of prosperity then is to demonstrate that the hedonistic approach to life is a moral, not an immoral one, right? A country built on puritanism and all the rest of that crap. They had to toss that out and say, bye, bye, sell, sell, um, you know, drink this, eat that. Um, young, um, unmarried professionals had enormous discretionary income, even at those years, uh, comprising a, a whopping $60 billion market. Advertisers began to shape their messages around erotic appeals by glamorizing the lifestyle of unmarried people. Cigarettes, soda, cars, liquor, stereos, and other non-sexual items became vehicles for the sexual cell. The most famous of which, of course, is the 1968 Virginia Slim's cigarette marketing campaign to sell cancer to young women. You've come a long way, baby. As the 60s wore on and the Vietnam War escalated alongside a black resistance to racial segregation and discrimination, a layer of American society rejected the competitive values that bred capitalist success and the materialism that sustained a consumer economy. Music, drugs, and new clothing styles, as well as short hairstyles for women and long hair for men, all combined to fuel a culture of resistance and a new left. Sexual issues were part of the decade's youth upheaval. Sexual androgyny for both women and men became the norm among young rebels, and open rejection of gender norms was on display in some aspects of hippie culture, music, and radical groups. But for LGBT folks in America, the efflorescence of sexual expression did not begin until the waning months of that decade. In the heart of the nation's then largest bohemian enclave and gay ghetto, New York's Greenwich Village. The Stonewall riots that began in the wee hours of June, 19, uh, June 28, 1969, lasted six nights and catapulted the issue of sexual liberation out of the Dark Ages and into a new era. The involvement of many mostly closeted gays and lesbians in the civil rights, women's, and anti-Vietnam War movements shaped a new generation of budding radicals chafing at their own oppression. Influenced by the black power militants, militants who had made slogans like black is beautiful and black power, the argo of the radical movements, by 1968, the homophile movement, which is what it had called itself uh, earlier, adopted gay is good, that was a very radical thing at the time, believe me, trust me, <laughs> and gay power as their rallying cries. In San Francisco's Tenderloin District, there had even been a Stonewall dress rehearsal of sorts in the summer of 1966, when a cop's manhandling of a transvestite at a local eatery frequented by drag queens and gay street youth led to general havoc, in their words, including smashed windows and the burning of a newsstand. 
This event, known as the Compton's Cafeteria Riot, not only forced the police and restaurant management to stop harassing transvestites and other LGBT people, but led to the formation of Vanguard, the first known organization of trans transgender people and gay uh, street hustlers. hustlers. But nothing as dramatic or far-reaching as what occurred in New York in 1969 took off from that fierce expression of rage. Um, I won't have time to get into detail about it. People should check out the book. It goes into much greater detail about the Stonewall Rebellion and the organizing forces that came out of it, the Gay Liberation Front and the Gay uh, Activists Alliance. Um, Gallup uh, and other polling firms didn't actually bother to ask questions about homosexuality until 1977. Um, eight years after Stonewall. Then, at that time, to give you some um, snapshot, and of course this is seven years after Stonewall, so this is, we have no idea exactly what the opinions of people would have been uh, prior to the Stonewall Rebellion. So this is already when people were active, uh, mobilizing, and uh, this is uh, after the 1973 removal of homosexuality from the men uh, being a mental disorder um, from the Diagnostic uh, Guide for, for uh, Shrinks. Um, at that point, 27% in 1977, approved of gays as teachers. 51%, interestingly enough, agreed with gays serving in the military. Hmm. We've always been destined to kill for the empire. Um, and 26% uh, and, uh, said they would vote for a gay man to be president. Do they even ask that question now? No. Interesting. Uh, all of these figures today um, the same, if the same. Although we don't know about the gay president thing, nobody even throws that out. But um, but all of the figures around, uh, you know, equality and employment on the job, uh, et cetera, et cetera. All of these figures today are above 60 to 80 percent. Um, to give you some uh, some gauge, uh, we can't really know what the polls would show in the pre Stonewall era. But the fact that the questions would have seemed so outrageous and unimportant to ask in the first place, I think, is what's most telling. I want to talk now about shifting gender norms. Because by the 1970s, the majority of women worked, had disposable income, and their demands reflected newfound freedoms and confidence. Two of the major gains of the women's liberation movement both occurred in the early 1970s. Roe v. Wade guaranteed a woman's right to choose an abortion, and Title IX forced all schools that received public funds to provide equal access to sports for women. Sports participation since the 1972 ruling skyrocketed at least 800% for all high school girls. And among black high school girls, it rose 955%. The social impact of Title IX on young women is undeniable, as study after study proves women's confidence, earnings potential, and even their tendency to leave a violent domestic situation goes up along with participation in sports. Comparing photos of female athletes over the last 30 years alone reveals a remarkable alteration in women's physiques. Women athletes today are demonstrably bigger, stronger, and faster than at any previous period as a result of the shifting cultural and political winds that opened vistas to them that were previously unimagined. It is an example of how the women's liberation movement, along with advances in training and nutrition, didn't just change laws, but actually altered women's bodies. Now we move on to the neo-Cold War of the 80s. By the start of the 80s, just as, the 19, as in the 1950s, the political right aimed to <clears throat> regain control over the social and economic liberalism that dominated in the 60s and 70s. Attacks on welfare mothers, pregnant black teens, and women's equality accompany the rise of a new Republican president, Ronald Reagan, who took office within a, yeah. <laughs> Piss on his grave, man. Um, <laughs> You should have seen the bidding war at the socialist worker offices, who was going to get to write the obituary when he died. Uh, Reg uh, Ronald Reagan, who took office with an assault on the American working class. In 1981, with union membership declining in absolute num numbers, Ronald Reagan fired 11,000 striking uh, PATCO air traffic uh, controllers without a challenge. As labor writer Kim Moody writes, the world of the worker was turned upside down with concessions, two-tier wages, and part-time and temporary work becoming the norm. Reagan's social conservatism matched his economic policies. Not until the final days of Ronald Reagan's second term in 1987 did the president even bother to utter the word AIDS, a disease that at that point had killed more than 20,000 Americans and infected more than 50,000 people in 113 countries in the six years since it had been diagnosed. 
That year, three out of four AIDS cases in New York City alone were diagnosed, diagnosed in gay men. According to playwright Larry Kramer, who helped initiate both the service-oriented group Gay Men's Health Crisis, which today largely caters to a black female uh, AIDS-infected population in New York, um, and, uh, and then uh, gave birth to ACT UP, AIDS Coalition to Unleash Power. Kramer's urgent demands for action first appeared in the New York Native, it was a gay magazine of that day, um, in the 1983 piece called 1112 and Counting, which began, if this article doesn't scare the shit out of you, we're in real trouble. If this article doesn't rouse you to anger, fury, rage, and action, gay men may have no future on this earth. Our continued existence depends on just how angry you can get. As much as the disease itself, it was the nasty political climate that launched the sex war on gay men in particular that fueled the escalation of the crisis. Reagan's communications director, <laughs> Pat Buchanan, remember him? <laughs> said that eight, and he was the communications director. Um, uh, Pat, he said that AIDS was nature's revenge on gay men, while Christian right-wing bigot, Jerry Falwell, yes. said, isn't he dead? Yep. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> um, said, oh, there's always another one to replace them. Um, said, AIDS is the wrath of God on homosexuals. I mean, this, is, this was not, this was on TV, this was on the radio, this was in the newspapers. Um, this was not some sort of marginalized opinion that was expressed somewhere out there in the hinterlands. Um, the moral majority, one of the most prominent right-wing groups of the era, did a mass mailing for funds that read, and I quote, why should the taxpayers have to spend money to cure diseases that don't have to start in the first place? Why should the American taxpayer have to bail out these perverted people? Perhaps the worst blow came from the Supreme Court in 1986, when it upheld anti-sodomy laws in Bowers v. Hardwick, only, uh, which of course were only then overturned in 2003, when I'm talking about ancient history. I remember when that decision, I was actually driving with my girlfriend to Indianapolis for her to come out to her family. That was exciting, <laughs> doing that with Bowers v. Hardwick playing in the background. Um, yeah. The sex wars of the 80s reflected a ruling class desire to reimpose an old sexual and gender order on a society where international competition was greater and the welfare state needed to be stopped. Under Reagan, a neo-Cold War erupted, complete with threats of nuclear warfare. By the 1980s, Russia appeared to be winning with a more productive economy, better missiles, and a growing navy, even though the system was corrupt and built on propaganda. America, once again, fearing Eastern Bloc militancy, mili uh, Eastern Bloc military, military and economic competition, uh, moved to rearm and build up its forces. Reagan vastly <clears throat> increased defense spending while Russian forces entered Afghanistan in a war that would ultimately bring down their economy and with it, the Eastern Bloc. ACT UP, queer nation, uh, you know, of course, uh, ratcheted up the protests throughout the early 80s uh, into the um, early 90s. I don't have time here, nor will I get into it. I do in the book uh, about certain uh, political critiques of these. But nonetheless, it is unarguable that consciousness shifted as a result, as well as policies in this country shifted as a result of the mass protests um, that were initiated by those groups and others like them. And it really, in many ways, paved the way for the kinds of social explosion that we have all been partaking in over the last uh, year and a half after the Prop 8 uh, uh, decision in California when unorganized uh, individuals really confronted uh, with denial of civil rights took to the streets. Uh, mass consciousness has obviously draft, uh, shifted drastically. 89% of uh, uh, our, our, uh, the population at large or for LGBT equality in the workplace and on and on and on. The fact that the President of the United States, you contrast this, and, and, and we are all critical, uh, massively critical of Obama and independent of the Democrats and must remain independent of the Democrats, I would argue, if we're going to be effective in our fight. But the fact that he feels the urgency as a result of our protests, as a result of our organizing efforts, to get up there a week ago and once again for the second June in a row since he's been president, you know, call this June, you know, sort of LGBT Pride Month and talk about once again uh, repealing DOMA, uh, repealing Don't Ask, Don't Tell, and guaranteeing full equality for lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender people. This would have been unheard of earlier without the active uh, uh, struggles and protests of the past of the past years. And just sort of, I want to raise some stuff in conclusion for the discussion. Because the, you know, the big sort of $64,000 question that hangs over this is whether or not capitalism can allow for an end to sex and gender norms. Can homophobia and transphobia be eliminated under this system of profit and competition? 
The shifting economic needs that created both repression and resistance have broken down barriers and changed consciousness. Yet the ruling class still fights us every step of the way. It is quite possible, and in my opinion, even probable, that LGBT people will win full formal equality under the law. That a majority of Americans will come to reject homophobia and even transphobia, but the ideology can persist for a long time after legal shifts. Contradictory forces are at work both to create liberatory possibilities and constrain them at the same time. Sex, gender, and sexuality will continue to be contested terrain so long as a tiny minority that controls capital needs to find ways to divide us. So long as the profit motive reigns supreme, which is the essence of capitalism, they must try and convince us that the state is not responsible for providing childcare or paid leave. They must continue to separate out the reproduction of humans uh, into a privatized family sphere from the production of goods in the workplace. The ideological and material, st material stakes for capitalism remain high, even as social consciousness shifts. It's why we grow up learning that men and women are somehow opposites, that we are practically different species. Men are from Mars, women are from Venus. I think it was the 1990s bestseller title put it, but, but to so much of our sexual practices, our emotional states, our reactions to each other and the world are the result of social engineering. Despite its common sense appeal, the idea does not stand up to scientific inquiry. Rigid gender roles and behavior aren't essential to our biological nature, rather they are essential to the nature of our society of capitalism. We are fed the notion that even our bodies are vastly different from each other, men and women. So, so different, so, so different. In fact, we're very much alike. While we never are encouraged to conceive of our bodies in this way, both primary and secondary sexual characteristics are awfully similar in functioning and occasionally even in appearance. The clitoris is stimulated like a penis and comes in various sizes, yes it does, men, uh, and, 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 and breasts come in a wide range of sizes on both men and women, uh, thus the man boobs. The rest, the rest of our bodies are more similar than they are distinguishable from each other. And when civil rights, training, and nutrition are equal, it is increasingly difficult, at least for me, to tell the difference between some of the best trained male and female Olympic swimmers when they're wearing those state-of-the-art one-piece suits. Um, that is, those are, those are simple facts. We already live in a world, obviously, in which women are defying all sorts of uh, gender norms of the past of 60 years ago. Women wear pants, they can have muscles, they can even marry other women, they can have kids or not. Huge advance, um, <laughs> especially for people like me. Um, attitudes are shifting, in particular in urban areas and among youth, which make it increasingly difficult for the powers that be. However, let's not lose sight of the fact that consciousness is never static and doesn't always go, uh, doesn't only go in one direction toward progress. History is not a force in and of itself. And I just want to um, cite this from Marx. Um, uh, he wrote this in the Holy Family. He said, history does nothing. It possesses no immense wealth. It wages no battle. It is human beings, real live human beings who do all that, who possess and fight. History is not, as it were, a, pe a person apart using human beings as a means to achieve its own aims. History is nothing but the activity of humans pursuing their aims. There's nothing natural or inevitable about our rights. We have got to fight for them. And in my opinion, sex, sexuality, and gender will continue to be contested realms because if our bodies and family lives, if our erotic choices and gender behaviors can look any way we choose, then how can people at the top justify the status quo? Our out of the closet existence defy norms. But to overthrow these norms, we've got to overthrow the system that has conjured them up. It's why I'm a socialist, and if you agree with me, it's why you ought to be one too.
gay men and lesbian women in World War II. Uh, both of these are available in the market and now in the section. Picking up a can of worms and it's worst I'm injecting an unwelcome topic into an irrelevant conversation. But um, I, I, I'm really wondering, I, I'm, there are so many seasoned political thinkers in the room, yourself included. <laughs> um, I recently learned that, uh, I don't remember the exact statistic, but the Equal Rights Amendment, I think the majority of Americans believe that it passed in 1982. And I understand that it, in itself, all these other battles that we're actually have legitimate we're, we're actually fighting right now, but that 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 one particular thing could have sweeping changes as regards to the LGBT community, as of course all minorities and, and and women, of course, who happen to be a majority. Um, I, I just want to throw that out there and see if anybody has any thoughts as far as what can happen there, what is happening, what has happened, and why it hasn't. <laughs> okay. I'm from Western Massachusetts. Um, uh, the myth of the nuclear middle class um, family in the United States would say is another example of how capitalism um, is shaping or has shaped sexuality and gender norms in the United States. And I say it's a myth because if you look at who were quote unquote the actual welfare queens, for example, over time, the, the major a lot of funds went to the middle class in order to make them this like comfortable facet of society. Um, and a really good book that looks at kind of the history of where funding actually went and how so much of it did go to the quote unquote nuclear families that are that are the, the quote unquote <coughs> uh, financially independent. Just like, oh yeah, the, the family doesn't need money from the state. We, we work and we can do it all on, on our own. Is a book called um, The Way We Never Work. And I forget the author, but it goes through it. It goes through your welfare and economic um, subsidies for um, the middle class and people that are married, heterosexual, and that uh, want to have kids. Yeah. Do you have uh, yeah, I wanted to, to just speak to the kind of contradictory things that are happening right now. Because on the one hand, I think that um, support for LGBT issues is at a record high, historically. Um, I mean, some of the statistics that are out there right now of how many um, people are in, like, I'll just read some statistics real quickly about... Um, Um, 89% say would support equal rights in the workplace, 59% um, think that homosexual acts or homosexual relationships should be made legal, 46% um, say that there should be marriage equality, and I think that's, and I also think that there has been a shift in transgender rights. I know I'm an organizer in Boston, the fact that we could, or, like when we organized um, a week of action, it wasn't from social, I mean, although socialists supported this, it was from our allies that automatically said, the key next question is transgender rights in Massachusetts, and Massachusetts is now discussing passing a civil rights bill in favor um, for, specifically for transgender people, is really significant. I think that's a huge change. Um, at the same time, though, I think the question that was brought up about ERA and also employment non-discrimination, I mean, like, these are things, it's just boggling. When I talk to my coworkers that, who are, don't, you know, I'm like the only person they know that's queer around them, who are like, I have no idea that you, you can't serve openly in the military, or that there are no protections for LGBT people in the workplace, is really boggling. And I think it, I think it really raises the question as to why that is. Why is, um, you know, why is there actually um, no, you know, why don't we have an all-inclusive Employment Non-Discrimination Act? And I think it really goes back to this desire that, uh, or this attempt by the right wing and by this government to not want to have us to have protections. It's much easier to attack us, to attack our unions, to attack our wages, if we're divided against each other just in the same way that they want to divide, you know, pit us between immigrant and non-immigrant, black and white, I think that there's a real attempt. I think, I think there's this continued, I think part of this attack on the working class is continued 
with this attack on LGBT people to want to, to say that we are not, that we are second class and that we don't deserve the same rights. And I think that there is still that, you know, that, that attempt, and I'm just, I'll end on this, that I'm, I'm really glad that you gave the history of um, the right wing trying to defeat the New Deal and how they did that through sexuality and gender. Um, and I just I want, it'd be really helpful if people can kind of speak to the <coughs> that, you know, similar dynamic that's happening right now. We're on the next speaker too. I encourage you to become a transgender activist and an ISO member and a member of EAA, EAA also from Gainesville, Florida. And um, I'd like to point out a few things why there is this strife in our community with the transgender and with the LGBT society. Um, if you notice, it shows that there are 38 states where there are no transgender protection at all. There are 29 states that have, L I mean, 21 states have LGB protections. So we're down nine states right away uh, off the bat. And a lot of the things that happen is that some of our capitalist um, gay groups, like I'll throw out the uh, HRC, for example, back in 2007, when they were trying to get a comprehensive end of bill passed, they took the T out of it so it would pass, even though they knew Bush was going to veto it. So instead of standing in solidarity with us, they took our money and threw us once again under the bus. The other thing that you have is when Sherry Mess uh, mentioned the uh, 1973 uh, DSM-4, where they said that gay is no longer a mental disorder, well, I'm still considered 37 years later to be a mental disorder. <laughs> Which I don't think I'm quite a mental disorder yet. I'm working on it. <laughs> um, what I do feel is that in, in the solidarity of socialism, we have complete inclusion of GLB and T. What a lot of people forget or don't mention that Stonewall was started by the street queers and the transvestites in New York City. Right. Sylvia Rivera being one of them, and she is one of my heroes. Yeah. at this convention this, this year concerning the, the trans issues. And next year, I've received some assurances that there will be a workshop strictly on transgender issues. Because while we do need to stand the same, <laughs> while, we do, while we do need to stand together as allies, there are major differences. And one of the major differences with a socialist program would be that many of my brothers and sisters in the trans community would not have to turn to earning a living in the streets. Mm -hmm. Because with health care, we would be able to get our meds, we would be able to get our um, surgery if we did go all the way like I did. So mm -hmm. it's, it's very important that we work together, but it's very important also that the differences are noticed, because there are major differences between the communities. Mm -hmm. that you said, Sherry, which is that... Um we, as socialists, um, don't believe that we can f achieve full sexual liberation or equality under capitalism. And, and the reason why I think that's so important and like relevant to the multiple struggles going on right now is that we don't just believe that about the end of homophobia or transphobia, but we also believe that about the end of sexism, about the end of racism, is that none of that can be achieved under this current oppressive system and I, I guess I want to pose a question to the room which is that I um, I work with an, an LGBT rights organization called Join the Impact in Boston Ooh. and we're <laughs> yeah. um, but we're currently struggling with um, the idea of whether or not standing in solidarity with other groups will um, help to grow the movement or not, and um, the socials within that group are, are very clear about that. But I, I, I would like to pose a question of how do folks feel like we can make a, a tangible case that standing in solidarity with other groups really is 
what is necessary to folks who don't see it as clearly as perhaps we do, that you cannot achieve uh, like sexual liberation within this current society. Thank you. So I wanted to say, um, kind of echo the sentiments of Amira, who was talking about how um, you know, the institution of capitalism will always try to divide um, working class people, pit them against each other. It's, you know, old fashioned divide and conquer strategy. And I think as far as the LGBT and, you know, sexual and, uh, you know, liberation from gender roles is going to come a lot from, you know, talking to even heterosexuals and telling them, uh, you know, uh, heteronormative people, telling them, explaining to them that, you know, um, all of this, you know, gender roles are LGBT oppression and their heterosexual oppression as well. Um, because, you know, I, I'm, a, I'm a psych major, and a lot of the work we do focuses on, you know, what does it mean to be male and female, and the biological differences, and, you know, what's, what is the, the difference between being, you know, identifying as a certain gender and biological sex, and, you know, they haven't really found any, um, you know, concrete, conclusive evidence that the brains of men and women are so vastly different that, you know, we can't, there are, there's no overlapping behavior between, between you know, the two so-called genders. Um, the fact is that we're all human. And we're pushed into these boxes, these extremes, until we, you know, until um, society kind of forces us to become a mockery of, you know, each gender. So you have these, you know, hyper-masculine men who think who are, you know, no fault of theirs, they're told but, and taught by society that this is the way you have to behave if you're a man. And there are all sorts of causes for, you know, domestic violence and, um, you know, depression, all sorts of mental issues. But I think one of them has to do with the fact that we're very limited by the status quo of gender and what it means to be male and female into expressing ourselves and our emotions in certain ways that are, you know, very reliant on the gender binary. And it's very devastating. It's, it's destructive because it runs contrary to our human nature, and that's to experience a vast amount of emotions. And that's to behave in lots of different ways and to experiment with different gender roles. Because um, pushing, you know, pushing us to the extremes is not natural. And um, as far as uh, the non-trans inclusive enda, I just want to say it's a mockery of justice. Right. Fuck it. <laughs> really put so much emphasis on the church as if it stood above society on some level. And the very important history in this book, The Lavender Scare, was that that battle, you know, that, that morality way, you know, war that was waged was from the government. For 25 years, the government actually was defining morality. And this is, you know, kind of a, a history that, that's kind of been hidden because I think the church has been given so much of an emphasis right now. And with the fact that we've actually had a civil rights movement um, existing for the last year and a half and the statistics that people have been saying that are at the all-time high, some of the biggest shifts we've seen in the, in the demographics have been among Catholic churchgoers. They've had, you know, war that was waged was from the government. For 25 years, the government actually was defining morality. And this is, you know, kind of a, a history that, that's kind of been hidden because I think the church has been given so much of an emphasis right now. I think telling them, explaining to them that, you know, um, all of this, you know, gender roles are LGBT oppression and they're heterosexual oppression as well. Um, because, you know, I, I'm, a, I'm a psych major and a lot of the work we do focuses on, you know, what does it mean to be male and female and the biological differences and, you know, what's what is the, the difference between being, you know, identifying as a certain gender and biological sex? And, you know, they haven't really found any, um, you know, concrete, conclusive evidence that the brains of men and women are so vastly different that, you know, we can't, there are, there's no overlapping behavior between, between you know, the two so-called genders. Um, the fact is that we're all human. And we're pushed into these boxes, these extremes, until we, you know, until um, society kind of forces us to become a mockery of, 
you know, each gender. So you have these, you know, hyper-masculine men who think, who are, you know, no fault of theirs, they're told by, and taught by society that this is the way you have to behave if you're a man. And there are all sorts of causes for, you know, domestic violence and, um, you know, depression and all sorts of mental issues. But I think one of them has to do with the fact that we're very limited by the status quo of gender and what it means to be male and female into expressing ourselves and our emotions in certain ways that are, you know, very reliant on the gender binary. And it's very devastating. It's, it's destructive because it runs contrary to our human nature, and that's to experience a vast amount of emotions. And that's to behave in lots of different ways and to experiment with different gender roles because um, pushing, you know, pushing us to the extremes is not natural. And um, as far as uh, the non-trans non inclusive enda, I just want to say it's a mockery of justice. That's right. Fuck it. <laughs>